Bianca and for everything they're doing at CCI, ministry program. Go and find out more afterwards at the info desk. Uh, on my way in this morning, several people already threatened my life, uh, as well as my family's safety. Uh, I'm not sure about, because uh, they realized that I'm preaching and the Springboks are kicking off at 11. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very well aware, and the last such person is Charles, um, who just gave me this to bring it up with me to the stage as a reminder that the Springboks are playing today. And... Um, <laughs> So it is a privilege to be with you this morning and um, to just share and to continue to explore along this topic of uh, Monday morning atheist. And uh, we're then concluding this uh, service. So I'm going to try my best to be short and sweet. Uh, for the last few weeks at all the DOXA campuses across the globe, uh, we've been busy with this series. Uh, it's called Monday Morning Atheist, and if it's your first time here, relax. Uh, we're just exploring the topic of why do we switch God off at work? Why do our actions on a Sunday not necessarily align with our actions at our place of work Monday to Friday? So uh, it's based on Doug Spader's book. Uh, it is available Tops can send you a, a spam uh, or a, you know, illegally downloaded copy. Um, no, no, no. We have the blessings uh, of the, the author. Um, but if you want to get your hands on a copy of that PDF, you can ask him. So he studied the phenomenon where our behavior is not necessarily aligned uh, Monday to Friday with the Sunday. So uh, maybe you can call it spiritual schizophrenia. Um, if you like. There's a, there's a bit of a secular, sacred divide. And uh, we, we sometimes view certain things more spiritual than others. You know, working, mm, that's not spiritual. You don't know my boss. Now, the author's ministry is called Work Life. And uh, there's a free quiz on their website, which some of you might even have completed uh, during uh, the course of the last few weeks. So there are two slides that show us the result of everyone within the Doxadeo family who have completed this quiz across the globe, and we call it our top 10 spiritual work issues. Now, it's quite interesting. Number one, the biggest challenge for all of us who completed this quiz uh, highlighted is, I often make work decisions without hearing or talking with God first. Because I studied, and I'm an expert, and I know what I'm doing. I don't need God. Second thing, I struggle to express why Jesus is the center of my life and work. I seldom get away from work to rest. Ladies, that was your chance to use that holy elbow anointing. You know, just uh, connect it with the ribs of your husband if uh, he doesn't rest or take time for family enough. I'm not comfortable to discuss my faith. I rarely connect with other believers at work. I usually don't feel God's presence when working. Sometimes my work behaviors are affected by fears. It's difficult for me to talk about Jesus. God is rarely top of mind. And I struggle to manage my time. Interesting. Ten spiritual issues at work which we are grappling with. So before we jump into today's topic, um, for the sake of the first time visitors and maybe our friends online, um, allow me to just briefly introduce myself and uh, brag a little bit with my family. So my beautiful wife, Karina, uh, she is German, so please pray with me. Um, and uh, then of course our kids, uh, our eldest Kaylee is grade eight, uh, she's a teenager, Again, pray for us. Um, and then uh, Ruben and Ella. Now, as family, we are passionate about people. We love being around people. So uh, if you're hosting a braai and people can't cancel last minute, you know, you're welcome to invite us. Uh, we will stand in. But we love people. We're passionate about people. And uh, the other day, Karina was telling the two little ones uh, this story about Jacob and how he had to work you know, for Rachel. And uh, there was like seven years, and uh, 
then we don't know exactly how it happened, but he, he got Leah. And Leah, I'm sure, had a mustache. And, uh, you know, then he had to work seven years more before he got Rachel. And Kaylee walked in on the tail end of this story. And she listened, and she then asked, do we know these people? <laughs> so in her defense, we, we do know some weird people. Um, <laughs> but um, and maybe, of course, none of them are here this morning. As a family, we feel that we are full-time in ministry, and that's within the business world. We're not employed by church. We strive to be salt and light wherever we find ourselves, and we have an interest in a few businesses. So uh, we're involved in the HR or human capital space, like uh, Bianca alluded to. We're also in the marketing and branding space, as well as property. We're responsible for the leadership development program uh, or process called LifeWork Leadership. And uh, just because Bianca came to impress with a short video clip, um, I also want to show you one. So, uh, Stefan, if you're ready. LifeWork Leadership started in America 30 years ago, and five years ago, we became the first city outside of the U.S. to launch it here in Pretoria. Amazing testimonies of business leaders, uh, managers at their places of work uh, in corporate organizations, or then business owners that have embarked on this transformational journey. And um, the city shown on the screen uh, in white are the existing chapters, and uh, the ones in blue will be launched early in the new year. And uh, you might recognize even a few European cities there, as well as Nelson Mandela Bay uh, in South Africa. That's PE. So we did an in-depth chronological study of the life and teachings of Jesus, and we found at times he spent it with the three people closest to him. And you can call it his C-level guys. He's COO, CEO, and CFO. And he took them aside, and uh, as the others kept on meeting, he took them to a separate boardroom at a bit higher up places, and he shared certain things with them. And then, of course, we know the 12, the disciples, and it's worth mentioning as we're busy in this series about the workplace, that all 12 of the disciples were chosen out of the marketplace. None of them were theologians. Now, we love pastors. And we love people that are in the full-time pulpit ministry. And we need them. And uh, they pray for us. I mean, that's a full-time job. Uh, we know. But Jesus chose his 12 exco members or board members out of the marketplace. And then there are times where he spoke especially to the 70. And then other times they filled lofters and had an each time event where the multitudes came. And then they had to order Kentucky, you know, to feed everyone afterwards. So if you would like to discover how to live your calling at work or through your business, and you would like more information, visit our website, visit the Facebook page, or afterwards, there's a brochure like this uh, at the info desk. Enough marketing. Now for today's topic. So in a world of social media, we're so used to display this perfect image to the outside world. It's always the coolest selfies with important people, and we always smile on all of those photos. So according to the rest of the world, and especially our previous girlfriends from high school, uh, it looks like we're always leading these perfect lives. 
We never face any difficulties. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, the wheels sometimes do come off at times. So just as you update your relationship status on social media for the older generation, just bear with me here, um, there is something like social media and there is a relationship status and it's important that you the whole time communicate you know, with your network out there whether you are in a relationship or not and what type of relationship. And one of the options there is it's complicated. So, um, you know, this is a typical millennial thing. Um, you're not sure, you know, if you're involved or you're not involved. Um, hopefully it's not anyone married <laughs> that would choose that status. But it's complicated. And, you know, maybe if we're linking this to our work life or business and connecting it with our faith, maybe it's also a little bit complicated at times. You know, there are certain laws and there are certain policies and procedures in place at a lot of businesses where I'm not allowed to freely share my beliefs um, with others. So maybe things are a little bit complicated. Maybe you feel that your work might be insignificant because it's not spiritual enough and that you're only hanging in there so that you can earn a salary on which you can tithe or give offerings and then support the spiritual work. God doesn't want us to just survive and just live month to month for that salary we earn. Nor does he want us to just climb this so-called ladder of success in the corporate world. He has destined you for a life of significance. And he wants to use you there where you are. So at times, I find myself in the world of HR or human capital. And because I'm, hel I'm passionate about helping organizations craft their organizational culture and realign their values, their belief systems, um, employee engagement, and so on. I found these shocking stats uh, by a research institution called Gallup. And um, they found that only 13% of employees worldwide are engaged. That means 87% are disengaged. They don't like their jobs. They show up only to earn their salaries. They probably hit the snooze button nine and a half times every morning when the alarm clock goes off. They don't want to go and be there. Now in South Africa, the Gallup survey produced alarming findings. Only 9% of the workforce in South Africa is actively engaged. Of the 91% who are disengaged, 45% of them are actively disengaged. That means that they are very negative about their jobs and their work environments, and they are likely to spread that negativity to co-workers. So they are actually actively sabotaging your business or the organization you're at. What does this or these stats show us? People are extremely unhappy at work. How sad is it that you have to show up every day to face people you don't even like, to do something you don't even enjoy? Now, there's an example of President John F. Kennedy who visited NASA before that first moon landing. And as he walked around and he met all these incredible people, rocket scientists and very intelligent people. And he asked each and every person, so what do you do here? And what do you do here? He came to the janitor. And this cleaning lady said, I am busy putting a man on the moon. That was her job description. She realized that this mission was so important and the part that she played in it, even though she was just cleaning the floors, she realized if there was something messed on the floor and one of these rocket scientists ran and they slipped and fell, it could have delayed this whole moon landing project. And maybe the Russians would have beat them and been there first. You see, that's what we want. We want organizations, businesses in our city where each and every person realizes the significance of his or her role in that bigger picture. You see, it's like this beautiful puzzle. And... How terrible is, is it if one or two of those puzzle pieces are missing? 
Maybe you and your family have embarked on one of those a trillion piece puzzles and you built it and it took 40 days and 40 nights. You know, normally you're over the Christmas period when the budget's a little bit low and you can't just go out. You say, family, let's build this puzzle. I can see none of you can identify, so it's just the Menars. And, uh, you know, it is, it, it, it's a good test, you know, for any marriage and for any relationship with kids to build this puzzle together. And how terrible that last day when you realize, oops, there are more spaces, more open spaces left than which there are pieces for. Oh, what a waste. What a waste for the plans that God has for our city and for our country and for our continent if some of us don't show up and we leave those empty spaces. Now, when considering the idea of us partnering with God through our work, I decided to consult Professor Google just for the meaning of partner, partnership, and partnering, because I really want to impress you guys this morning. So partner is firstly a noun, and it could mean either of a pair of people engaged together in the same activity, either member of a married couple or of an established unmarried couple. I'm not sure what the definition of an established unmarried couple is. Or it means to be the partner of, in the sense of it being a verb. Now, partnership is the state of being a partner or partners, and an association of two or more people as partners. And then the two definitions I really liked on partnering. It's a strategic alliance. It's establishing a long-term win-win relationship based on mutual trust and teamwork and on sharing of both risks and rewards. Did you realize that you're actually not working for a boss or even for yourself if you are self-employed? You're a steward, you're a manager, and you're working for an audience of one. You're working for God. That puts it in a different perspective. Now, some people believe that work is cursed, the form of punishment for us to sweat because Eve took the first bite of that apple. Men, you missed the opportunity to say amen. <laughs> the truth is that God created work and it was blessed before the fall. Adam and Eve worked with God daily in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 1, God introduced the concept of work when he started to create this universe, which is still expanding. And we were created in His image and in His likeness. We were created to be creative and to work. Now, Jesus said in John 5, verse 17, which we read in one of the previous weeks, My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I, too, am working. So Jesus set this example for us. Jesus worked 90% of his life on earth. The first 30 years, he spent in the family business as a carpenter. And he was so good at it, he was so skilled, that he was known far and wide as Jesus from Nazareth, the carpenter. They knew him. They knew of him. Now, if, we, if I tell you, uh, use brand names, whether it's Checkers, Pick and Pay, Woolworths, Pep. As I mentioned a few brand names, maybe there's an association when you hear certain things. And it may be past experiences at those organizations or businesses. And maybe it says something about quality and of service. Jesus was known for a superior quality product and service. He was good at it. 90% of his life he spent in that. Now, we learned the previous weeks when Tops and Louis and Johan shared it so well with us that the Hebrew word in the Bible for work is avoda, and it means worship. So just like singing and serving and giving your tithes and offerings are all forms of worship, so is your daily work. A.W. Tozer said, it isn't what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular but why he does it. So why are you doing what you're doing? 
God created the concept of work and invited us to partner with Him on this exciting adventure. In Genesis 1, verse 26 to 28 in the message, it reads, God spoke, let us make man or human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature. God bless them. Prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. And that Hebrew word for take charge is radar, and it means dominion. God has given us the, the authority, and He has given us the task to take dominion, even at your place of work. And even though you're not the top of this food chain at work, Necessarily, you have to take charge and have dominion and have authority of your desk, of your space, of your area of responsibility. How can you partner with God in this mission? 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9 in the Passion Translation says, We are co-workers with God and you are God's cultivated garden, the house He is building. Other translation says that we are co-laborers with God. We are God's field. A cultivated garden or a field is not just something where it, no work is involved. I'm not a farmer, but I do know enough to know that there's work involved in farming, in cultivating a field. Another translation says we are God's construction project. We are His house. How can you partner with God in reaching the lost, healing the pain, and restoring the brokenness in your community, at your place of work? 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1 in the message says, Companions, as we are in this work with you, we beg you, please do not squander one bit of this marvelous, marvelous life, this gift God has has given us. You see, we are co-employed. Don't squander God's grace, the mirror translation says. Don't squander God's grace, this gift of life. And I want to say, don't squander the opportunity. If you are currently employed or you have a business you're running, do not think, ah, oh, it is just a means to an end. No, realize that God wants to use you through that day-to-day -day activity at work. Don't squander it. John 15 verse 4 and 5 in the Passion says, so you must remain in life union with me, Jesus talking, for I remain in life union with you. That's a partnership. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I am the sprouting vine and you are my branches. As you live in union, in partnership with me, as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. Now you see, sometimes... Difficulties happen and um, life happens, as they say. Sometimes the paw paw hits the fan or the wheels come off and we face difficulties. Has anyone ever been retrenched? There are a few people. I've been there. I've gone through that. Have, and I'm, I'm reminded a few years ago we had good friends, managers appointed in our business. And overnight, they left and the partnership didn't work out. Maybe your business is not doing so well. Maybe you have a terrible boss and you almost feel victimized currently at work. I can identify with all those situations. And there, there were times where I would lie awake at night, and which is a miracle because I love to sleep. My wife can testify. And I would lie around... And, you know, all these thoughts in my head, and it would be as if God would say, what are you doing? I would say, God, I'm lying awake and I'm worrying. 
I'm stressed. And he would say, what are you stressed about? I would say, how are we going to pay for this? And how's that going to happen? Then he would say, but you tell people that I'm your source. I've always been faithful. I've always been good. Why would I let you down now? And then other times when people might have upset me, I would again wrestle at night and the Lord would say, what are you doing? And I would say, God, I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm busy strangling someone in my thoughts. God would say, but why? Lord, it's as if I feel they stole from me. They, they did wrong things to me and to this business and to the organization. The Lord would say, but you tell people that it's my business. That you work for me. Every one of us is called for full-time ministry. You see, your work, your place of work, your business is your pulpit. And even when you face difficult times, someone said, non-Christians don't read the Bible. They read the lives of Christians. So even if you face difficulties or you face storms, the people around you are looking attentively at how you are reacting. How are you responding? Are you trusting God? Your actions speak louder than words. We're all called to be salt and light. We have to make a difference. Now, tops, I heard from friends who have visited bars. Apparently, and again, I'm just talking on hearsay. So apparently, if you go into a bar... On the counter, some people are very generous and they display peanuts because they, they feel you know, sorry for the customers who might be hungry. But you see what they don't realize is the marketing brilliance in that because the peanuts are salty. And what happens when you eat something salty? You get thirsty. Okay, some of you are a bit slower to die. I can see you already there in Japan. What am I trying to say? That we are salt. We are supposed to make people thirsty for God. Salt prevents rotting taking place. We all know biltong. Some of us like it more than others, I can see. Um, but we are also called to be light. We have to drive away the darkness. And oh, the challenges we face in the economy in South Africa today. Corruption, unemployment, we can mention all these things. Light is needed. We have the answers, and I firmly believe there are unique business ideas, there are patents that need to be registered in this room. New businesses, new opportunities created so that we can solve that unemployment rate of 60% amongst 18 to 25 year olds. It's dark. The challenges, the facts are there, but you and I can solve it through our work, through our places of work. Are we called to be thermometers or thermostats? Now, a thermometer can measure the temperature in a room. And how often do we go in as Christians and we very quickly discern what is wrong? And we, we're good at pointing it out as well. But you see, a thermostat determines the temperature in that room. And that's what we're supposed to be. I remember starting off um, my uh, career as a teacher. And uh, the very first few weeks at this brand new school, my classroom was directly next to the teacher's lounge. Uh, so, you know, all the, the important teachers could keep an eye on me. I'm sure, I, I know it now. But one day on my way, to my classroom, the, the little old tea lady who's worked there for 30 plus years grabbed me by the hand. She pulled me into her office, the little kitchen next to the staff room, and she said, pray for me. I'm sick. Now, at that stage, my business card did not yet say that I pray for sick people, you know, on the odd occasion. So how she knew it, I have no clue. 
But she sensed my confusion, so she helped me out of it. She went on her knees, she put her hands in the air, and she took my hand and she lay it on her forehead. She knew how it was supposed to work. And still, as I was hesitating, and you know what is happening in this situation, the moment my hand hit her forehead, a demon started manifesting, and she was roaring like a lion. Now, in this split, split second, I'm, I'm just assessing this situation here, and I'm waiting for the principal to walk past, and I'm wondering, how would I explain this situation? What am I busy doing? So I didn't pray a long prayer. I just said, shut up. And as I instructed this thing to shut up, it did. And she got up, she dusted herself off, and she said, thank you, I feel better. And she went on. I never drank tea at that school again. I must admit. But you see, sometimes God will put you in situations where you will be the salt and you will be the light. Navon Johns said, a person's character is shown through their actions in life, not where they sit on a Sunday. I want to encourage you to be the best accountant, the best doctor, nurse, teacher, student, business owner you can be. One day, I was presenting a leadership course, and it's a two-day development course, and uh, the first day went very well, 30-odd people in the room at this one company, and all their executive managers, and we ended off in this workbook on page 27. So the next morning, I knew I'm going to carry on from page 28, and uh, a few things happened. First of all, I woke up quite early. Again, miracles, I knew. It had to be the Lord or the devil waking me up so early, and uh, I started praying, so I knew, okay, it's the Lord waking me up, and I had this, not an anxiety, but a, whew, I was excited, this excitement about the day ahead, and as I started playing around with thoughts, where well, yes, I'm carrying on page 28, and this is what we're going to do, and I realized the Lord has plans, and on my way to that venue, um, it was uh, thanks to ESCOM, um, load shedding, so there were several traffic lights out, so the Lord could just build on my character a little bit, you know, I could pray in tongues on my way to this venue, and I ended up being five minutes late, which is something I would absolutely hate under any normal circumstances, and as I run into the room and apologize and get my laptop out and get this workbook out, everyone is already sitting there, and they had tea and coffees already. I apologized and I started, and as I opened it on page 28, I realized that I was going to be disobedient if I wasn't going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, just to put it into perspective, this was not a Christian course. It was not a Christian company. Um, it was in a secular environment, leadership development taking place. And I said, Lord, what is it? And uh, it was as if the spotlight went on over the head of one lady sitting in the front row. And I turned to her and I said, Ma'am, do you have a headache? And she said, Yes. And the room went quiet because they all saw me come in late. And they knew that she just told all of them around muffins and coffee about this terrible migraine she's having. And she th said she's going to try and see how long she can still stay there for the day. So they were all, Whoa, okay, what's happening here? I said, would you mind me praying with you? She said, sure. So I prayed, short prayers, said amen. She said, wow, it's gone. The 30 other people in the room, we had their attention. And when I said we, I had nothing to do with it. It was God. And for two and a half hours up till the next tea break, the Lord used that opportunity to speak words of wisdom and just prophetic encouragement into people's lives. Tears, I mean like tissues, you haven't seen so many. I had to apologize for what a great te uh, grade two teacher did and what that uncle said. And I didn't know these people before, but I was willing to be an instrument. And uh, at the end of it, the CEO said, wow, that was the best team building we've ever had. <laughs> Not that it was a team building, but you see, God might just want to partner with you tomorrow. And whether it's someone that's going to roar like a lion or uh, someone with a headache, 
maybe it's someone that desperately needs a smile or a word of encouragement to say it will be okay. Now, how do you react when a child shows you one of their masterpieces? And on your way in here this morning, hopefully you got one of these Lego blocks. If you didn't, on your way out, we will give it to you. And uh, there's a, a picture of a masterpiece built by Ruben, our nine-year-old boy. And I don't really know what it is. And uh, when he showed me, I had the choice of either saying, wow, what a waste of time. How long did it take you to build this worthless piece of whatever? No, don't worry. That's not how I reacted. I said, wow, this is incredible. You're going to be in construction. Just look at this masterpiece with Lego. And he could smile and look proud. Now often is it maybe that at your place of work, you feel like it's insignificant. And this building project you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis at your work, it feels meaningless. But God is inviting you today to partner with Him. Join me, He's saying. I have and I see the bigger picture. I have good plans for this city and for this country. Dad is super proud of your creative efforts. He recognizes himself, his nature, in your creativity and in your efforts. He encourages you today to keep on growing and getting better at it. Now, there are two people in the Bible who are involved in large-scale construction projects. And the first guy is Noah. Noah's life preached a silent sermon. There's no record in the Bible of Noah ever proclaiming the gospel or ever preaching out of the Torah, out of the scriptures, or telling people to repent from their wicked ways, to change their lives. Not at all. God told him to build the Titanic. He, he gave him this project to construct the biggest float you can imagine. It was 137 meters long, 11 meters high, 23 meters wide. It weighed 15,000 tons. Now, from that time of construction, thousands of years ago, the first time where a vessel like that was built, again, the same size, same magnitude, that could actually float on water, was in the 19th century. God gave him these plans. Do you know how long it took Noah to build the ark? 120 years. Now that's a building project. Those of you who have endeavored on any building projects or renovations at your home, it's the best test for a good marriage. Trust me on that. If you feel like you're in a good place and you just want to test it a little bit, Winston, Cassandra, you know, start building. 120 years. And every day, the people around him, his life, his work, his faith in the Lord to diligently continue building, continuing in this task the Lord has laid in front of him. His life preached a silent sermon. The second guy is Nehemiah. Now, he was working for the king, so we can call him a politician. He held various positions, and then one day he took the initiative to start leading the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. Now for 50 years they tried and failed. They couldn't do it. And he managed to do it in 52 days. Him and his team. You see, he, he heard from the Lord. He said, God, I'll be your project manager on this one. Let's go and do it. And how did he do it? He challenged each and every person, each and every household, each and every business close to the wall to take charge, to take ownership of that piece of land and that piece of the wall in front of their place and to start rebuilding. And as they're rebuilding, half of the people had to stand watch because the enemy wanted to obviously prevent this from happening. If you can take that piece of Lego and maybe just hold it in your hand and... Um, I want you to take it home with you and take it with to work tomorrow and go and place it on your desk. Maybe next to the computer, wherever you spend time 
day at work, or if you're a student, put it in your uh, suitcase, briefcase. And every now and then when you see it, be reminded by God that you are part. You're invited by Him to partner with Him on this building project in the city of Pretoria. What is your silent sermon of which your life and actions testify at work? How can you partner with God to establish or expand His kingdom? What is broken at your place of work or in your industry which you can help fix to heal the pain? Will it always be easy? Absolutely not. Will bad things happen to Christians? You bet, yeah. But you see, there's a purpose in a storm. God, Jesus, sent his disciples into a storm. Not so that they will go and drown there. But you see, I've learned through the difficult times, even at work or through business, in the difficult times, God can, create, can, can reveal parts of his nature which he could not reveal to you on dry land. You see, he could have sat with the disciples next to a fire, and he could have said, you know what? I can speak to the wind, I can speak to the waves, and it will calm. And they would have thought, is it true, isn't it? But you see, when the storms were there, and he came walking towards them, and he said, check this trick. They said, wow. So I want to encourage you, even though you might be facing difficulties, maybe there's a purpose in the storm. Maybe there are parts of God's nature which He wants to reveal to you. And then I want to end off by telling you that there's power in worship. I had the privilege of preaching in the Doxa campus in PE last Sunday. And the Monday I stayed on to meet with leaders and uh, start strategizing about the a launch of LifeWork Leadership. And during lunchtime on Monday, they said, let's go and show you something. And they, a few business people started a ministry which they call Kingdom Business Rescue. So whenever a business is facing the worst kinds of difficulties, they say, okay, we'll come, we'll bring worship leaders and we'll bring intercessors. And for an hour, if you can close your business and Everyone in the business will just worship with us. That will be a start of something God can do. And people would say, what? We don't understand it. So Monday, I went with them to a plastic manufacturing factory in PE. And they had to let several people go, and they've been going through this Section 189 retrenchments. And uh, when the unions found out that they're calling a meeting where everyone's going to be together, they started contacting my friends, and said, what's going to happen? They said, you're so welcome to also join us. So on this past Monday, for an hour, we worshipped in this factory where lots of the people were not Christians. They didn't know the words to the songs, but for an hour, we just worshipped. And afterwards, the owner phoned and said, you know what? Tomorrow morning, we're starting with prayer meetings in this factory. One of the workers came and said, he wants to organize it, and he wants to lead it. The union representatives worshiping there with us phoned us afterwards, said this was incredible. We have lots of businesses and their names facing difficulties. Will you mind coming and worshiping at all of them? What are those creative ideas God can give you? We don't understand it. David, so many others, went into war, not with weapons, but with musical instruments, worshiping. You see, something happens when you worship. Can you stand with me? Maybe you're facing difficulties. Maybe you feel like your work is insignificant. Can we take two minutes and just worship God? And I will give you all my worship, I will give you all my praise, for you alone I long to worship, you alone are worthy of my praise, and I will give you all my worship, I will give you all my praise. For you alone 
You see, your talent is God's gift to you. And what you do with it is your gift back to God. Let's partner with Him. Let's change our spiritual relationship status to, it's not complicated. Let's represent Him well. Father, whatever the difficulties might be, maybe some of us feel that we're, what we're currently doing might be insignificant. May we accept this invitation from you today to partner with you on this building project. May you use us to inspire, to touch, to change people's lives. Thank you.